Well, now let's talk about oil. And we'll start by talking about the Keystone Pipeline Project, which uh, was something that started to be uh, uh, floated as an idea in 2008, 2009. Essentially, the idea is the transportation of oil from Alberta, Canada. And several of these pipelines were built. Phase one uh, essentially cut across Canada, then straight southward through the Dakotas, through the uh, eastern Dakotas, uh, down to Nebraska, and from there to Illinois. Uh, then the second phase just simply uh, connected uh, the Nebraska to Cushing, Oklahoma. Then a third phase connected Cushing, Oklahoma, down to the Gulf Coast and Houston uh, area. And it was the fourth phase that uh, attracted a lot of public attention. It was a shortcut, essentially. You can see it there in the green line. Um, a shortcut that would uh, carry the oil through the, uh, uh, the north uh, eastern corner of Montana, cutting diagonally through South Dakota down into Nebraska. Um, for one thing, the oil is not oil that's being produced in traditional oil wells but rather it is what's called tar sands oil or oil sands, essentially bituminous sand uh, from Canada that has got, um, you know, a lot of uh, oil sort of absorbed into it. And there's a process in which the oil is removed uh, from, the, uh, from those sands uh, and then uh, it would be transported by pipeline. Now, there was a big promise that there would be a lot of jobs created by this project, 42,000 jobs during the two-year construction of the pipeline. Of course, that would only be temporary. There would only be 35 permanent jobs once that uh, phase was complete. Um, and as, uh, as they were gearing up to do this, uh, there were a lot of environmental concerns, and there was concern particularly in the native community. Now you have to understand, there were Native American activists protesting this, and there were non-native environmentalists protesting. Now the environmentalists had a, a, a range of different things that they were concerned about, not the least of which was just more oil, right? More carbon emissions uh, and more damage to the environment. And there was a, quite a bit of concern about the uh, extraction process up in Canada. Uh, turns out that the area around those uh, tar pits has 16 times more mercury than it's supposed to because mercury and other heavy metals are used in the extraction process. So that, uh, that upset environmentalists. The Native American activists were concerned about those things too, right? Because of the seven generation rule. The, the need to scale back on this uh, carbon pollution. But more immediately, there was a concern about potential oil spills in this long pipeline. Because look at the route that it was going to take. Let's take a closer look at it, okay? Um, you'll notice it cuts through there, it enters into Montana, it goes right in between the Grovant and Assiniboine reservations, goes down through Montana, gets close to the Cheyenne and Crow reservations. Uh, and then it comes into South Dakota. It uh, goes uh, right past the Cheyenne River Reservation, which is not far also from Standing Rock. Um, goes right, uh, essentially right through the Rosebud Reservation, right next to Pine Ridge, uh, also close to the uh, Crow Creek Sioux Reservation and the Yankton, Dakota, and Santee Sioux Reservations. Uh, and then it goes all the way down there into uh, Nebraska, which you can't see on this map, but then it'll go right by the Ponca Reservation in Nebraska. So major spills would cause major problems. Uh, there's also the fear of contamination of the Ogallala Aquifer, which basically supplies water to several states there in the West. But the people who would be affected first would probably be um, 
the reservations because it goes so, so close to them. So that was a big part of the reason for the protest to begin with. And those protests really became dramatic beginning in 2011 when a large number of Native American protesters and non-Native allies uh, showed up in Washington, D.C., protesting uh, right outside the White House. The leaders of several tribes were arrested, um, at least temporarily, as a result of these protests. The protests continued and, in fact, only increased both in Washington and along the route of the uh, possible construction of, of this pipeline. Got a lot of press and a lot of pressure was being put on President Obama in 2011 and 2012, leading up to his re-election. One of the uh, Native leaders that was in the forefront, sort of leading the charge in this protest, was, was this guy, the Ponca known as White Eagle, alias Carter Camp, the American Indian Movement uh, leader. He was one of the top guys in AIM, if you'll recall. Uh, and he devoted his uh, uh, last couple of years of his life to uh, fighting this pipeline. He passed away in December of 2013 at the age of 72. Well, finally, in February of 2015, Congress, in fact, passed the law authorizing the pipeline, and President Obama vetoed it, and Congress was not able to override his veto. In November of that year of 2015, Obama officially announced the project dead uh, to the consternation of the Canadian company that was wanting to build the pipeline. Uh, but President Obama said that uh, it was uh, really more trouble than it was worth. It really wasn't going to provide that many jobs compared to the damage it would do to the environment. All right, well, first of all, here's a, uh, a map of a typical oil field that just shows where these various petroleum products that we're talking about are located, right? Um, you can see the coal bed methane uh, up there that they wanted to extract near the uh, Northern Cheyenne reservation. Well, um, in 2014, uh, it was announced by uh, um, an oil company that they were going to be building a pipeline to speed crude oil from the uh, oil-rich shale fields in uh, northwestern North Dakota. Uh, they were going to be uh, speeding those to, uh, to Illinois. At, uh, you know, super, super speeds. Um, and there were, there was a few months for people to, to make comments uh, uh, about the, I'd uh, ask questions and so forth uh, until January of 2015. Construction started in June of 2016. And once again, uh, it looked as though some native people were going to get screwed over. Let's take a look at uh, the, uh, well, let's look at the proposed uh, site, uh, and actually, let's let's take a look at this first. Let's take a look at the original proposed site there, with the dotted lines. That was the uh, that was the original plan. However, you'll notice it crosses the Missouri River north of Bismarck, North Dakota. The people of Bismarck, North Dakota, put up a huge fuss because they perceived that could be dangerous to their water supply if there were a leak. Uh, they put up such a fuss that uh, kind of at the last minute when construction was starting, the route was changed so as to avoid Bismarck, North Dakota, and go a more southerly route, which would take them right along the edge I mean right at the edge of the uh, northernmost part of the Standing Rock Sioux Reservation. And they would be crossing the Missouri River with this, uh, this oil pipe right there at the border 
of the reservation, and that, of course, was the reservation's sole water supply. Well, this was problematic for the uh, Lakota people of the Standing Rock Reservation, obviously. Um, some other problems uh, included the fact that along the route of this proposed site were several burial sites uh, and several sacred sites. Outside the reservation, yes, but let's take another look here at this other map. Outside the reservation, but inside the area that the, uh, the Lakota had not ceded to the United States in the 1851 Treaty of Fort Laramie. Remember a long time ago, I told you to, to remember that. Hopefully you did remember it for the test. But here it is coming up again in 2016. They never ceded that land. They wound up agreeing to be within the boundary of this reservation, but they still have rights in their traditional land that they did not cede, even though they don't technically, as a tribe, own that land. So that includes these, these burial sites. So there's all kinds of issues going on here. Uh, there is the uh, destruction of sacred sites. Uh, that violates a couple of Supreme Court decisions right there. There is crossing the Missouri River right at the border of the uh, reservation. That is a violation of the Supreme Court winter's rights that uh, the safety of the water source of a reservation uh, can't, be, uh, uh, can't be impinged upon. Um, but you'll notice they have the, the, the Cannonball River, but it connects right there with the Missouri. So if there's an oil spill, it's going to hit all of that stuff. And that's, uh, that's not even taking into account the fact that many of the Standing Rock tribal members pointed out that uh, really shouldn't be building this stuff on unceded land, that they have rights to that as well. So all kinds of, of different issues, which led to massive protests beginning in the, uh, the, the summer of, of 2016, actually starting earlier than that in the spring. Uh, protesting went on for months, but uh, the media didn't really pick up on it. But as the year went on, and the construction got closer to the Standing Rock Reservation, the media did eventually start paying attention. Uh, really, in a way, they had to because there were so many Native American protesters. There were a lot of non-Native allies as well, but th there, there was a huge number of Native protesters. Uh, some estimates put it at, at one point, up to 4,000 American Indian people at the protest site just outside Standing Rock, which is the largest uh, uh, assemblage of Native American people since the Battle of the Little Bighorn. And they were coming from many different tribes, um, not only to uh, participate in the protest, but to supply the protesters. At one point, I think the uh, Cherokee Nation in Oklahoma sent a convoy of water bottles, other tribal governments sent other relief supplies, especially as fall turned into winter. And well, uh, even, if, even if you're not from the Northern Plains, you should know from our coursework so far, those winters are pretty harsh. One of the most uh, interesting uh, uh, events in this whole thing, when you're looking at uh, pan-Indian uh, participation, is that there was even a contingent that showed up from the Crow Nation in support of the Standing Rock Sioux. And, uh, you know, that was, that was unheard of because, you know, they still, did, still didn't get along that well. There was a lot of bad history between them. And here is a map that I should have included a few minutes ago that gives you an idea which reservations, aside from Standing Rock, are, uh, are close by the proposed pipeline. The Fort Berthold Reservation up there, that is the uh, uh, Mandan, Hidatsa, and Arikara Reservation. The little orange dot is the location of the Sacred Stone Camp 
which was the camp for protesters of the pipeline, initially inhabited uh, by Standing Rock Sioux Reservation inhabitants, but quickly joined by many other indigenous people and non-indigenous environmentalists and allies. Um, it was established on April 1st, 2016, by a uh, standing uh, rock historian, LaDonna Brave Bull Allard, who lived there on the reservation. Uh, and here's a picture, by the way, of the uh, uh, chief, uh, David Archambault. There was uh, um, such an influx of people coming into the camp, which was right in the path of the uh, uh, construction uh, of the pipeline, uh, right in the path before it reached uh, the, the water. So, you know, water protectors. There was such an influx that uh, the camp couldn't accommodate them all, and there was an overflow camp established nearby called the Ocheti Shakowin camp, which is uh, an expression. If you've been following these lectures, you should recognize the uh, seven council fires of the Sioux people. Well, um, early on, by that spring of 2016, in, in addition to uh, uh, the other people we've mentioned, there were a couple of youth groups indigenous youth groups, one that was established right there on the reservation called Respect Our Water, and uh, the other one was already in existence, the International Indigenous Youth Council, and they got uh, a lot of a lot of press and a lot of attention with some of the things that they did, and these were like kids 12, 13 years old. Uh, also, Honor the Earth, that organization that uh, was co-founded by Winona LaDuke, they got involved, and with the uh, with the continuing uh, coverage, which minimal as it was, was uh, nonetheless sort of enhanced by social media. In fact, speaking from personal experience, I became aware of all of this on Twitter and Facebook months before you were seeing anything about it, or I was seeing anything about it. Uh, in the news, certainly not the main headlines. Anyway, uh, as people became more aware of it, that is non-native people, uh, they even uh, got the opportunity to learn some Lakota because the phrase mini wichoni started showing up a lot, which means um, water is life. The, uh, the no dapple hashtag that is no Dakota Access Pilot. In September of 2016, David Archambault appeared before the United Nations invoking the Fort Laramie Treaty of 1851 for reasons that we discussed a little bit earlier. President Obama uh, ordered a temporary halt to the construction. The Army Corps of Engineers was, uh, was supposed to have done a, uh, a detailed impact study, and that had kind of been rushed through oddly enough. So he called for a, a temporary halt just as they were uh, about to reach the area there of the, uh, uh, of the sacred rock, uh, sacred stone rather, camp. By October, construction had begun again. And as they drew closer to the uh, to the sacred stone camp, tensions escalated. In addition to the private security that had been hired by the uh, construction company, there had also been a call in North Dakota for uh, sheriff's deputies and police from various, uh, various different towns in the state who came fully equipped for riot control. They were... Uh, um, in possession of all kinds of uh, weapons and militarized gear, much of it uh, military surplus, that kind of looked incongruous when compared to the, uh, the protesters, many of whom were little children or elderly people. Almost sounds reminiscent of some other stuff that we discussed earlier in this class. Anyhow, 
uh, eventually in October, there were, uh, there were conflicts that resulted in the use of water cannons against the protesters. Dogs, attack dogs being sicked on them. Several people were injured. Many people were arrested and uh, detained in sort of temporary cages that looked very much like dog kennels. There were uh, uh, all kinds of things being, being implemented, tear gas. Uh, uh, one young woman lost her arm when she was hit by one of the projectiles. There were uh, reports, well, I personally uh, heard a report from someone who was there of some of these, uh, some of these police officers beating several elderly ladies who were standing uh, in, in the uh, path of the uh, construction crews and singing and praying, uh, beating them with, with nightsticks. This started to leak out due to, to social media. Hence, uh, eventually the rest of the, the country did start to become aware of what was going on. But often in the press, the way it was presented was that the, uh, the rowdy protesters, the rowdy natives had done various things that had provoked the police uh, and sort of forced them into bringing to bear all these weapons on them, which again, sounds eerily reminiscent of a lot of the stuff that we've heard. Finally, after the, uh, um, the fact that this was becoming more and more um, evident in, in, in the press, uh, largely due to, you know, not necessarily the, quote, mainstream press, but rather um, a lot of uh, social media and, and smaller outlets. Due to that pressure, President Obama finally, at the beginning of November, as the cold weather was setting in, called for, again, a halt to the construction for another evaluation by the Army Corps of Engineers. And finally, on December 4th, 2016, it was, uh, it was announced by the Army Corps of Engineers with the blessing of President Obama that the uh, pipeline was not going to be continued, that they were going to take time and come up with an alternate route that would not be going uh, uh, so close to the, uh, to the reservation. So many people heaved a sigh of relief, except it wasn't a very big sigh of relief because this is December 4th, 2016, several weeks after the presidential election and President Obama was about to leave office and Donald Trump was about to come in. So people were collectively holding their breath to see what would happen because he had already expressed a lot of uh, sympathy with the construction company and with the oil industry and none really with the uh, native protesters. Donald J. Trump was inaugurated on January 20th, 2016, and four days later sat down to sign an authorization to resume construction on the Dakota Access Pipeline and the Keystone Pipeline. On February the 2nd, the, uh, the camp at uh, Sacred Stone was raided and 76 people were arrested. Now, like I said, people have been holding their breath to see what, what would happen. Most of the uh, protesters had gone home because, uh, well, really, really harsh winters, right? But some had stayed just in case. Well, uh, here they are being arrested. Uh, three weeks later, the authorities came in and destroyed what was left of the camp and arrested the people who were still there. In March of 2017, in an event called Native Nations Rising, more than a thousand American Indians protested 
in front of the White House. In April, once again, the uh, Standing Rock Sioux tribe appeared before the United Nations in protest of uh, the, uh, uh, the violence uh, against them, as well as the violation of their treaty rights. This time, they were represented by Brenda Whitebull, who was, uh, who is the great-granddaughter of Sitting Bull. President Trump, meanwhile, when he signed that initial January 24th, 2017 order, uh, made a statement about uh, the intention of these orders and regulations. This is about streamlining the incredibly cumbersome, long, horrible permitting process and reducing regulatory burdens for domestic manufacturing. Uh, many of the people that we've been meeting with over the last long period of time, but yesterday and others, uh, the process is so long and cumbersome that they give up before the end. Sometimes take ma it takes many, many years, and we don't want that to happen. So the uh, idea was to expedite the long, drawn-out, horrible process and get things rolling. However, a federal judge did not agree with the president and in 2018 blocked the uh, Keystone Pipeline, uh, preventing any, uh, any further work on it due to the fact that the Trump administration had given no regard whatsoever, according to the judge, to uh, environmental concerns, particularly the concern of oil spills. However, in March 2019, Trump once again signed a new order authorizing construction to begin on the Keystone Pipeline, and it did uh, begin in the middle of the uh, COVID-19 outbreak, so there wasn't a lot of attention given to the fact that construction had once more started. Meanwhile, the Dakota Access Pipeline had been completed in April of 2017, the same month that uh, this, uh, this white bull was appearing before the, uh, the UN, only three months after the uh, protesters were, were cleared out. So one completed, the other on its way. And that brings us to the year 2020 with obviously um, a lot of challenges still lying ahead for the tribes of the Great Plains. However, like American Indians in general, they have not disappeared. In fact, as uh, the things we just discussed indicate, they are as much in the uh, public eye and on the historical scene as they ever were. And in fact, the, uh, the pipeline protests in particular, the Keystone and Dakota Access protests, really signified uh, an entire new and very sweeping movement, very similar in many ways to the, uh, the Red Power movement. And although it remains to be seen how things will play out, there's every possibility that in the end, all this coordination among tribes and all this solidarity among tribes will have similar results to the efforts of those activists during the Red Power era because, well, the most important thing is making sure everyone knows they are there and the issues that they face and inspiring, inspiring people around the country. And that is, in fact, what they have done. In fact, what they've always done.